Well, I've been, it's the last talk of the day, so, uh, you know, not an easy timing. We, we actually. And, uh, Dr. Minna, we actually have another one on CSR after that. So this is the last one on ESG. Well, for me, <laughs> for my timing as well. So I've, I've been on a red-eye flight, um, actually from COP. I'm coming from Egypt. So, you know, not such great timing for me, I guess. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to be talking about three stories, yeah, to ease it for all of us, more for you um, than for me. But then, you know, to, I'll be talking about three stories. Um, before I get into those three stories, um, since I am coming from COP and since this is a house full of some wonderful NGOs, uh, I must say that um, at COP, they were, they were either the national delegations, right, the political delegations, um, and then there were international NGOs who were admitted to the formal um, you know, process at COP, and they were NGOs like you. So a big, big applause to all of you because you are the ones who are really determining the fate of this earth. They were not private companies. You know, they were not private companies. They were governments, international NGOs, and NGOs like you, yeah? And uh, some of the three key takeaways, like now I, I'll take the liberty of uh, sharing. Um, one is, I think this COP is being seen, and I saw it firsthand as the COP of implementation. So right from the opening plenary till the, the day that I left, you know, there was a lot of focus on enough talk, what are we going to do? You know, what do we do? Um, the uh, second, um, you know, the second big takeaway was that uh, there is a lot of focus for the first time on funding, on financing for compensation of loss and damage. I think that really has huge implications for developing economies like ours. There's a lot, you know, our coastline, we have a really long coastline. A lot of your, you know, the NGOs, all of you around over here, you work on, um, on, on issues which are related to loss and damage caused by earthquakes, by floods. Um, and so for the first time, there was this issue tabled about uh, who compensates and how do you fund that. Um, the third, um, you know, big uh, piece of conversation was on climate action, but again, financing climate action because um, countries were asked after Glasgow, you know, in COP27, uh, were asked to bring plans of how are you going to implement, which not too many company, countries have done. So I think 29 countries only have actually come in um, to Egypt with plans. But so at uh, COP27, the, the, the focus is on, all right, you haven't brought the plans, but let's talk about it now, that how you don't have a plan, but then how will you go back and build that plan about how you're going to fund what you're going to do, yeah? So these are some of the big, um, you know, takeaways, but most importantly, there's a lot, there's a lot for you. There's uh, $100 billion per year uh, to be spent, and um, um, not-for-profits, you know, it's for not-for-profits, companies can't be availing of that. Um, having said that, let's come to the stories that I promised. What does, um, what does sustainability mean to you? I'm, I'm not using the word ESG. Anybody? Great. Thank you. Using the resources in a way that it's also preserved for future generations. Another? Any other? Long term benefit. Long term benefit. Okay. One more? One more and then I'm going to start. Doesn't harm the environment. Okay. Three. Very good. Now, when do you think we first started talking about sustainability? When did the word sustainability come about somewhat in the sense that what all three of you at least the you know the first one and the second one how do, uh, that, that they mentioned how when did you think we started talking about it which year which one 2013 okay rio summit yes 2000 1980s, all right. One more? 2010. Okay, 
How shocked would you be if I told you it was 1798? <laughs> so it was 1798. You know what we were talking about in 1798? Who knows? We were talking about food. We were talking about food. At that time, in 1798, sustainability was about food. We talk about food security, even now, or the lack of it. But we don't talk about it in the context of sustainability. It's kind of become two different issues, right? And we talk about it in the context of environment nowadays. Isn't it the third answer? Environment. But in 1798, when we started talking about sustainability, in the sense that, that food is growing, food grows in an arithmetic way, but the population is growing in a geometric way, right? So for the first time, Thomas Malthus, he was a demographer, a population scientist. So he was having a drink with his friend, and he went back and he wrote a, story, a book out of it. And the book was about how are we going to keep up? How is uh, agriculture, how is food going to keep up? It's resources. We talk about resources now, but we don't talk about food as a resource, right? But there are many reasons for that as well, because you know, agri-tech has prospered. I'm sure many of you work on that as well and so on. But the point here is that the meaning of sustainability in 1798 was about food, that how is, how is food going to food as a resource going to catch up going to, uh, with, with the growth of the population. The other point to note over here was that he was a demographer, he was a popula pop population scientist, he was an academic. So for years, the conversation around sustainability was in universities, was amongst academia. From population science it went on to economists. Economists started talking about it. That's when, from food, they expanded it to other resources as well. Water, natural, you know, minerals. So now it's coming closer to what we are talking about, right? So economists were talking about this, that all the other resources as well, you know, how is that going to keep up with uh, the needs of the human population, right? And then this went on. I mean, the whole of 1800s, and side by side, of course, it's keeping in, keeping up with the wars and keeping up with industrialization and so on. But it's still very much amongst academics still, and economists mostly, until the time in 1964. 1964, there was uh, the Club of Rome. Anybody uh, who wants to say explain what the Club of Rome is? A uh, group of people, I think around 50 years uh, back, they have written one uh, nice book and uh, they, uh, uh, without any political and other thing, they decided, uh, like, they, they tried to envision what is going to happen in future and according to that prediction, by 2070, uh, this earth is going to become unsustainable. Okay, thank you, thank you. Limits to growth, Limits that to book growth. is very famous. Very good. So that's so taking a step further. So Club of Rome is a group of people, ex-leaders, ex-heads of state, a little bit like a private UN. So they come together. It still exists. Um, they come together, and then they um, work together on issues which are beyond just country issues, right? So this. So they, the Club of Rome, they heard about all this chatter going on amongst economists. And they were like, you know, there's something that's brewing, right? There's something, there's something going on that people are talking about. And so they commissioned, they commissioned a study to MIT, which both of you just mentioned. Thank you. So they commissioned a study to Donald and Daniela Meadows. And, and, and that study took a few years. In 1972, that was published, The Limits to Growth. So thank you. The limits to growth. That study, very famous as you said. So that study did an empirical, you know, a simulation of what's going to happen and what to do about it. And simplistically put, it was an 
alarm. It was an alarming call to action that this is the last generation that will be able to do anything about it, right? Then what happened? 1972. A lot happened in 1972. This got published. Then there was a magazine, media, media comes in, right? So magazine came in. You probably know the name of the magazine. The Ecologist in, in London, they made a issue, like a, a separate magazine issue, like Business World makes of our <laughs> research. They made, they, and that issue was called the Blueprint for Survival. Till today, on Earth Day and all of that, you'll still see the New York Times publishes an extract, somebody or the other publishes an extract from that Blueprint for Survival. It sold millions of copies. And there, ladies and gentlemen, sustainability was mainstreamed. That was when this happened, right? So that's when millions of copies, that's when people start, you know, woke up to say, oh, you know this, because it was simplified, things were, it was, it was, it, you know, from universities and academia, it was now brought to people's doorsteps in a magazine, packaged in a magazine, right? That's when the UN came in as well, the same year, 1972. There was the UN convention in Stockholm, right? Brought together developed countries, developing countries for the first time to talk about this. And then rest is history. After that, there were several meetings of the UN, UNEP came in, um, you know, the United Nations Environmental Program, they came in, and so on. And then after that, of course, you know, we all know COP, after COP, 26 COP, today this is the 27th. Um, in the meantime, there was a definition which came about of sustainable development in 1982. And then later, of, and, you know, there was a, and initially the, de the definition of sustainable development was about conservation, was more on focusing on conservation. And then Grow Harlem, Grow Harlem in the famous Brundtland report, you know, so she came up with the definition of sustainable development very much in the lines of what you, the first two definitions were, that how do you, um, you know, how do you grow today, how do you use the resources of today to make sure that tomorrow is not effective, right? But one last point, and I'm going to, you know, pause here, is that... Um, there's no really one definition, right? Because the definition keeps changing. It, it keeps changing according to the context, and it keeps changing according to the time that we are living in. Right? Today we are talking about climate. And for most people, sustainability means climate. We are talking about E, S, and G, right? 1798, we were talking about food. Maybe... Ten years later, we'll only be talking about pandemics. So whatever is the threat that we have. So, you know, um, you know, when I teach also, I, I, I'm always encouraged to think beyond what the present is, which essentially is what sustainability is about. Right? That to cut yourself out about thinking in the larger picture, looking beyond today and looking at the larger picture and essentially, 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 essentially it just cuts down to responsibility. Us as responsible individuals and organizations, whether it's corporates, whether it's not-for-profits, whether it's governments, about being responsible, just about being responsible. It's families being responsible. But I'm going to pause there, spoken enough. What are your thoughts about this? First story. Any any thoughts? Anything from there? Yeah. Very good. Somebody has to remind us of this word, otherwise we are not thinking about it. And, you know, my third story is about that. Thank you. Keep that, keep that thought with you. I'm going to remind. I'm going to bring that in again. Anything else? Okay. Sorry? 
Yes. Can't we think about the sustainability of immortality of life? Yeah, actually, people are thinking about that. There's a lot of science which is going. Well, I read this uh, just a um, few weeks ago that uh, it really, you know, stuck to stuck with me. It was that aging is a pandemic. <laughs> I, and yeah, and you know, aging is a pandemic, and there are now studies about how do you overcome because then they were like, you know, the number of people who die of old age is far outnumbers any pandemic. It really got me thinking. Okay, all right, great. So I have two more stories to go, which those two are um, personal stories, and they're also personal to you as well, because that's where this, the sustainability. Um, bridges to the wonderful work that all of you are doing. So personal, because um, you know it's a personal story, not, I don't think many people know, but um, you know, I was uh, 20, no, I was 19 years old, and um, you know, I'd got through a university to go to, and I've always been very independent, you know, I wanted to do things on my own, and so on. So I started writing to different organizations, charities to NGOs, and I come from a very, very modest family, and then, you know, so, and uh, my brother was preparing for engineering and everything, so I had to, like, fund my own studies. And then uh, I wrote to a lot of people, and then finally there was this one uh, NGO, and I won't take the name, one NGO, who uh, called me to uh, their office in Delhi, um, and I went, and then it was a flat, it was an apartment, and I came in, and there was a lady, who was, uh, who was the founder of that NGO, and uh, she didn't come in often, it was run by like other people and everything, and she came in, and she was just sitting there, and then she said, come, come have a seat. And I sat, and I was like this 19-year-old girl, you know, like uh, just trying to make my entry into the world, and she just sat in front of me, and she signed a check of 50,000 Indian rupees, and she handed it over to me. And she said, uh, Here's the, here, here, here you are, and this comes with three conditions. Number one, that you will forget that this ever happened. I clearly haven't. Number two, that you will never contact us again. And number three, that when life gives you the chance, you will do it for another person. And actually, that is the reason why I try to do it. I mean, you know, I, I agree that companies are different. Uh, they work from here, and NGOs work from here. But honestly, like, I've tried to make both meet. And a lot of the work we do is just for free. We support startups for free. We do rankings for free. We do a lot of stuff for free. But it is because of that, you know, because you pay back. And... You know, that is the power of not-for-profits. You know, from COP27 to what all of you, I, I mean, I run a company as well as a foundation, right? That has been created because of that one NGO. So that is the power of NGOs. And that NGO has created so many sustainable organizations. We work with 200 plus companies in India. We work in so many different regions. So you're talking about sustainability and NGOs. This is the power. You guys create a lot more. I'm going to finish with my third story because that brings you know, the point that you made. Um, that somebody's got to remind us about sustainability, right, in, in, in amongst NGOs. So fast forward many years now, fast forward many years, and, uh, you know, I, I quit banking. I was in the nice part of banking, managing hedge funds and stuff, and I was 26, and I thought, okay, either I continue doing this, uh, or I move to things which I really love doing and which was making an impact, right? So um, I quit all that, and uh, that time, and I started an NGO. <laughs> I started an NGO. Um, and, uh, and then that same year, then I joined the World Economic Forum as well because, you know, one of my mentors said that's a great way to, you know, use my private sector knowledge and see different models of how the private sector can impact as well. But that NGO, I kept running and I still run that, that NGO. 
Now, um, from Geneva, I used to go down to Nizamabad, where my NGO was doing some work, and then every few months. And I traveled there one, in, on one of my trips, and there was a small orphanage. There was an orphanage in Nizamabad. Nizamabad, for I'm sure, um, you know, you, uh, maybe you know, maybe you don't, that um, there is, it's a small place about three hours uh, drive from Hyderabad. And uh, that was an orphanage of, for kids um, where, uh, who suffer from AIDS. Um, and, and really my heart broke. I mean, these were little kids suffering from AIDS. And why were they orphans? Because these were uh, unwed mothers and uh, wives of uh, the men who would be away, uh, you know, mostly in the Middle East and stuff from, at least in, from Nizamabad, they're mostly in the Middle East. And so it was like almost like a taboo, you know, issue and a topic and all of them. So these firstly, you know, so they are abandoned kids. And on top of that, AIDS. And that NGO told me, that and and just looking at them, I mean that itself and the whole situation itself, it's enough to break all our hearts over here. And uh, then the manager told me that there is no money for their medicines. It's like why? What happened? It's like no, no money for the medicines anymore because the funding stopped. The CSR funding stopped. The CSR funding stopped. Now, somewhere, some company maybe changed its CSR agenda. The project manager maybe shifted. And this is why the work which Nidhi does and Santosh does is so important. Like all the stuff that you were talking, it's so important, the programming. But what is even more important for you, all of you, can somebody say? What is even more important? Sustain. You see, whenever you are forgetting, Try to remember this. You guys need to sustain. So it's very important to have models, business models. Business models doesn't always mean, you know, that you're, uh, you're a business. And a business doesn't always mean that you're doing business, right? Just like me. So, but for you, you have to have a business model which makes you all sustainable. Because if you are not sustainable, remember those kids. Remember those kids. Those kids are the ones who suffer. Much more than all of you and much more than any of us. That's it. Happy to take um, questions or comments. That's Sumit. <laughs> Hi, Minya. Hi. Nice to see you in person. Uh, so uh, my question is, again, you said you work uh, with a lot of companies and do, do rankings for them. Uh, a small question would be, uh, in the, the time that you have been doing these rankings, what is it that, uh, that you come up with uh, some starting, startling facts that Indian companies are still not doing and they should be doing, mm. and in terms of their partnerships with nonprofits and how can they improve on that? Yeah. Any insights on that? Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. Um, it's a great question. So we do um, rank, um, just for as, as context, we rank um, India's largest 200 companies on uh, their sustainability performance every year. And uh, we work all year round for that. Um, and by default, these 200 companies are taken. So it's not like anybody has to apply. There is no fees, nothing. Um, and it's a very research-driven process. Uh, Dr. Pandey, who leads the study, is here with us as well today. And uh, so, and we also speak to as many companies as possible during this process as well. So some of the, and, and we, um, we assess all companies on 31 KPIs, which are packed into six different aspects of sustainability. I'll stop there on the, on the model. Um, what um, trends we are seeing um, firstly, overall, and then I'll go to the NGO uh, part, is that, um, number one, um, disclosures, even in the last three years, just transparency is improving. 
it's definitely that's something which is improving. We keep a track of, you know, how companies are reporting. So that's very good. Um, and number two, then there's, uh, you know, um, the social, um, um, the uh, social impact of Indian companies is, uh, if I compare it to other, if we compare it to other countries as well, so it's it's very high. I think there is this philanthropic um, aspect to family-owned companies of India, uh, which even precedes the two percent CSR. Like when I was at GSPL, another you know um, um, a Indian company, uh, they, they were spending already. They were spending a percentage of their funds before the CSR, and I'm I'm sure it's the same for HCL as well, and so on. Um, so that's actually very strong, um, the social aspect. The uh, third piece is on, um, you know, certain sensitive aspects like gender, like inclusivity. Um, the it's um, it's lacking, firstly. Like you know, even if you look at women on in leadership positions and so on, um, the very very few who are anything close to even uh, above one third on leadership, and then on um, inclusivity. Uh, number one, the headcount, like just like men versus women, there again per sector we've got a you know breakdown of how they're performing. It's always it's it's really needs a lot of work, but very importantly, aspects like wage discrepancies, you know, access to leadership, these kind of things amongst inclusivity is not yet being measured. Some are like some companies are, but that's something which in our conversations with companies, we really try to push them up, like to be more sensitive towards inclusivity and so on. The last piece, uh, uh, overall trends, is on supply chain. Supply chain, there are some companies who are doing exceedingly well on integration of supply chain, exceedingly well. I mean, there are some ways of, of inclusion of supply chain nowhere else in the world, some really innovative ways. But uh, most others are not using uh, are not working their supply chain, you know, that they, that they can. Oh. So, <laughs> so, um, so those are some overall trends that we are seeing. Now, about partnering with NGOs on the social side, my first point on disclosures. So as disclosures for companies are becoming more, um, um, you know, it's becoming more mainstream, there is more know-how amongst companies, uh, to report, you know, when companies tell us that do the sustainability report, we actually say no. We say we'll teach you how to do the sustainability report. So that's that that capacity is increasing. Um, there are more regulations coming in as well, but that means that NGOs also need to start collecting data because that feeds in to various disclosures which companies have to report. Um, so typically, social impact. So NGOs will have to be giving, we'll have to get into, you know, uh, understanding what corporate reporting is and what does that mean for NGOs on environment and your, uh, even if a company is, uh, is um, uh, providing money, investing money through the foundation and through its CSR activities, that's looked up, that's looked at as scope three. So that also needs to be accounted for as well as a scope three um, expense. So, these two implications on disclosure. Um, other trends related to um, to NGOs. Um, there are uh, you know there are companies which do the programming on their own. So they have their own teams which um, run CSR, which you know run projects. And then there is this another model where they partner with NGOs as well. Briefly, there was a third model which had come where there were intermediaries. There were some organizations we saw which had come in which would help companies to spend the money. We're seeing that going down and you know, just these two models coming up where either companies are just doing it themselves and their um, teams or they're partnering directly, which HCL is doing, for example, is a direct, um, um, you know, um, they're directly in touch with a lot of NGOs. So the third one we're seeing, you know, had come up and now it's kind of, uh, you know, uh, diminishing. Um, and uh, finally, I, we, we also see there is a greater feedback loop which is coming in with the NGOs. Um, so companies are, bring, are, are learning also from NGOs, which earlier was not happening. The more companies which are setting up feedback loops, asking. So it's not a one-way thing that we'll teach you how to do things, but there is like a feedback loop that you tell us that what do you know, you know, uh, what's going on on the ground. And that's coming into the company. Companies are opening up channels 
of communication with NGOs so that that feedback loop um, you know, is fit within. Anything else? Any other questions or comments? Yes. I can hear you, then I can repeat your question if you want. Yes. Yeah, great. That's that's a great question, um, and um, you know, uh, I was it's a great question. So, um, the for those of you who didn't hear, who couldn't catch that question well, uh, the the gentleman was asking that um, Sudhanshu, if I got that right, was asking that um, you know, bus business plans. The, my third story, right? The need for a business plan, the need for all of you to be sustainable. It's not easy. It's easier for large organizations who have maybe a certain type of skill sets, who can hire certain kind of people. But for smaller organizations, it's very, very difficult, right? So how do you, how, how does one do that? So for that, um, my, you know, I'll break my answer into two parts. One part is that this model of HCL partnering with you is one way to do it, right? Because this is a business, you focus on impact, and then there is a flow of information and expertise which goes both ways. So that is one, and that's, this is why I said the two models of working with, uh, of corporates working with NGOs. So leverage this, you know, that. Uh, now the other part, let's say that you are, you know, an NGO is not part of HCL or, you know, another scenario. So there, number one, when you're even conceiving of um, a not-for-profit plan, Think about what your basic expenses are. What are your basic expenses? And try to have some kind of an income, a market-driven income, selling that or whatever those product is or whatever it is, a market-driven income to just cover your expenses. Because there's expenses and then there is growth, right? And if you're just covering your expenses, you'll just make sure you're break even, right? So even when you're conceiving the idea of an NGO, it's not enough to say that I'm going to, I'm, you know, I'm going to get all those 11 million kids off the street, on you know, of, of, of the streets who are living on the streets. That's not enough. What, what is it that you will do, and without grants, but what is it that you will do, smartly? Like you have to think smartly, that 
what is it that you'll do that will cover your expenses? Now, one thing is also that you lower your expenses as well. There's no need for that office, for example, right? So there is, so you keep your minimum. So just keep first you bal keep that balance, right? Then you go go out for grants. When you actually do that, you you stand a greater chance for getting grants as well because grants are given to NGOs who are thinking smartly, who are doing things smartly. Now the other point is when you're going out for grants, what's your BATNA? BATNA Anybody who's heard of Batna? Yes, negotiated agreement. Exactly. Have your Batna. So you know. So what's what? In case this funding doesn't work, what's the other one? Because every grant, every funding is a negotiation, right? You'll all agree. It's a negotiated agreement. I, I heard some comments also to Santosh. There is some data that has to be given, it's a negotiation. Now what's the other alternative? So in a way it's a plan B if you might call it, right? But that plan B shouldn't be after you've got one grant and then. So you know, big organizations might have big guns and going all out to a lot of places, but even it's about the mindset about first you break even, have like a certain model where you at least cover your expenses, keep the expenses low and everything. The second is even when you're going out for that for one funding, think about two. Think always about two. If you get one, that's not stable. You know, that's not stable because then you'll, even it'll affect your programming also. I don't know if how many of you, I've run an NGO, I've run a business, you know, I don't know how, if you agree because a lot of times you might be doing things which is answering the funding and maybe not answering the problem and so on and so forth. So in, in banking, it's called diversification. Right, you diversify. I know here also you would need to diversify. So if you just ma ma maintain these two rules, you're good to go as a business model. You don't have to do anything too complicated. Yeah, and, and I think about it as all the, just keep those orphans who, those kids who are orphans and who suffer from, from AIDS as a picture of that in your mind and you'll do things responsibly because you'll make sure that your NGO doesn't go bust. Okay, four minutes left, one last, yeah. Yeah, uh, good afternoon. This is regarding the sustainability of the NGOs you are talking about. Uh, there is a, a provision now, uh, of course, already it was available. There are Section 8 companies. Of course, uh, um, it is an uh, organization registered under Section 8, and it acts as an NGO. It has a um, um, ATG exemption and also 12A so that you can get grants. So this facility, you can act as an NGO, you can get uh, grants, you can also do sustainable businesses. You can participate in the tenders mm. and also there is a provision that 15% of your profit, uh, you can take it to the reserve also. So it is a good model for uh, sustainability when you are talking about uh, this matters, this also goes well. And also the government of India moves that now uh, the uh, trust, uh, all the trust and societies should slowly move to more um, sort of uh, what you call the um, organized sector way. Of course, this also organized sector way, but more of uh, a regulatory uh, um, uh, comes under regulatory uh, purview. Yeah. So this model also can be thought of. This will be a good supportive one. Yeah. And also we have like a social auditing. And uh, um, <clears throat> there are organizations which um, um, uh, which studies our uh, projects on impact also and the process also. It's not only impact, but the process also. So that you can be able to um, and get certified. That will attract the good donors also. Thanks. Very good. Thank you. Yes, uh, we, um, we Section 8 is a very good uh, structure. So we've actually at Anand Fest. Sumit is a fellow of Climate Action. We've created an incubator um, for startups, you know, for very early stage startups who are looking at sustainable, looking at, um, you know, uh, who's, uh, who are looking at design and architecture mostly related um, uh, sustainability. So that we've created it as a Section 8 company so that we're able to also receive grants, like as you said, and run it. Uh, we have one here. Um, I yeah. think we can take maybe one or two yeah. more. I'll be very yes. quick. Yes, uh, please. So, uh, thanks, so Ms. Minia, for your kind and complimentary words on the NPOs, especially NGOs. We feel you as a great ambassador for us. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, it's a reflection, not a question. 
Uh, there were understood stories uh, which were reflecting in my mind, lingering in my yes. mind in relation to the sustainability of what you are speaking. Yes. I am representing an institution called the Dawn Foundation based at Madurai. And basically, we have come across the model in which uh, the enabling mode of operation definitely brings sustainability at the grassroots level. Mm. And the development business model which you spoke, exactly it goes with the community financing as a de development business model, which I was running for the past 30 years, wherein initially the poor who were unable to save even 100 rupees, now they got federated into around 200 federations covering about 8 lakhs families. And now they are uh, giving employment opportunity for 800 professionals and volunteers hmm. and uh, having the total turnover of 1000 crores. Hmm. So ultimately the enabling model at the community level. So when we are uh, making them to generate resources and uh, generate community and govern the things, definitely it brings to sustainability at large. Thank yeah. you. Yes, very good. Very good. So, but you know, I'll just add to that. So for example, if you are running an NGO, you're running an NGO which is generating employment. You know, and maybe that employment for the community will come after three years, four years. So that's where, you know, you can include a little bit of your own business sustainability there. Have a very, very small percent maybe come back to you, but not immediately, you know, give a lot of time and so on. So this is where the not-for-profit sector, you know, uh, it might seem a bit radical, but then it has to also start operating, include some amount of their own business sustainability. Then at least you know, okay, it's gonna, returns are gonna come in after four years. Until then, let me sustain myself in other ways. So a lot of times, some, you know, the, uh, a lot of NGOs, uh, I'm not sure if any of you would be in this room, probably not, but a lot of NGOs sometimes don't have that mindset at all. It is always about grants. And when the grants go, then those kids, right? They are the ones who suffer. I think one more, yes. Uh, thank you very much for the very uh, interesting stories that you said, uh, narrated. Um, uh, my concern is like uh, as an NGO and uh, also working with a lot of NGOs, uh, NGOs are uh, kind of, you know, not very happy discussing about exit plans. Mm. And uh, that is where the whole uh, issue of sustainability, they believe that, you know, funds would keep coming and uh, we will not be able to, you know, uh, we'll be able to stay in that project uh, area for so many years. So I think that is one thing where uh, even uh, the donors also need to, uh, you know, question the NGOs that what is the exit plan and how do you uh, wish to uh, uh, reach out to other areas living yeah. this particular project area, one. The second uh, is um, in contrast to this, uh, now the CSR law, Mm. Uh, which we will be talking about, I think, in the next session. Uh, it's also becoming very, you know, time bound. Like, okay, till March, I don't know what will happen after March. So uh, mm. it also doesn't allow the NGOs to, you know, plan for a long-term sustained mm. pl programming, and uh, that also kind of uh, interferes. So I think uh, maybe uh, you could answer on these two things, and maybe in the following session. Uh, they can also take up this issue of how CSR Act and, you know, granting uh, timelines yes. can be considered. Before I answer, one question back to you. Yep. Why do you think that NGOs uh, don't like to think about an exit plan? Uh, mainly because uh, I think uh, getting out of the comfort zone, and having worked with uh, a number of beneficiaries, you know, you also sometimes get emotionally attached. So those those are the reasons. And also funding. Yeah, yeah funding, yes. Funding. So it brings back to the point for the funders as well as for the NGOs and most importantly for keeping the focus on impact, on actually looking at the objective of what both the funder and the NGO has set out to do. It's very important therefore to again come back to what we were talking about, about having a business plan that you know that not to be seeking the survival and the sustenance of an NGO should not be on these grants alone because if you're secure that um, you know my source my basic source of funding is this right and the other funds which are coming in the grants which are coming in coming in are helping to grow and I can tell you that all the NGOs over here 
you're as impact driven as you know the best ngos can be because but all you probably need is that basic sustenance and then you would be thinking more about impact that okay my aim is to make sure that the uh, hemoglobin levels of this community are brought to a certain level and after this it's done and i need to act somewhere else when so that mentality but maybe for a lot of other companies this might not happen because by ngos we i would say with me also you know we are all by, by definition we are thinking impact but what is sometimes missing is just that basic sustenance that is covered then you can start thinking about focusing just on impact right now on the regulations right on csr regulation so regulations will always keep changing regulations will always and you know even santosh also said there's always a catch up game it's always a catch up game even not just in csr uh, law i remember the times when you know this was being drafted and all of that so you know that not it's not just there but even for example the financial crisis and all of that crisis happened and then there the, the, there were laws which came in right so how how do how do you future proof yourself how do you make sure that you are playing ahead of the game now this is a very good bridge into my last piece that i wanted to end my time you know right now with you with is that we would be meeting again we would be meeting for workshops um across the country uh, we're all very excited about that and the roll out of some all some of the things that we talked about just now you know the roll out of disclosures roll out of business models um roll out of regulations that are at play roll out of how ngos how to understand the linkages between sustainability corporate sustainability regulations and ngos all of that the non story bits the technical aspects that i'm going to leave it that i'm going to leave it for the workshops it will just give us some more time to have a discussion and understand deeply all those aspects so looking forward to meeting with all of you in a smaller setting as workshops and going deep into all you know all of these aspects that we raised thank you